Okay, hello everyone and welcome to the next uh, session in the business and strategy track. Uh, a few familiar faces here I noticed. Uh, people are following tracks uh, more or less, I think. Um, and I hope that's been a good strategy for you. Um, now, uh, today we have, uh, the next session uh, now is Collaborating with the Public Sector by David Calculli. And have I, I've actually said that correctly, haven't I? Excellent, Just it's always worthwhile checking. Um, we'll just leave that door open for a little bit. I'll shut that in a minute uh, while people still come in. Um, and this is a session that I've really been looking forward to personally because um, I think it's sessions like uh, th uh, this session and also the next session uh, where Philippe Rubin will be uh, speaking about uh, selling Drupal to large enterprise that really underpin the theme of the conference, which is growing Drupal down under. So really I think you know, we need to look uh, uh, carefully into moving Drupal into large organisations, including government and enterprises. So this session obviously is foci focusing on uh, government. Um, now David is the business solutions consultant for Objective Corporation in New Zealand. Uh, he consults with the public sector to bring together end-to-end -to -end enterprise solutions enabling organisations to do more with less, which I find to be very intriguing and I'm sure we're going to find out a little bit about what he does and how he does it in a minute. So could you please welcome David Calculli. Wonderful, thank you, thank you. All right, have you guys been enjoying the conference so far? If you have, say yes. Yes, yes. fantastic, all right, so let's have a quick look about uh, the public sector. So a little bit about me. I started developing software at age 12. I got my first Turbo C compiler and I was working out what on earth does all these symbols mean and from there I uh, started developing various bits of software until I got into web. And my first uh, real job was developing Drupal brochure sites for a graphic design agency and so we'd create various types of uh, websites that would start off from the simple five pages about us, contact, who we are, what we do, through to the pacificcoast.com.au, which won the New South Wales Tourism Gold Prize in 2011. So that's an iPhone app and a website that helps you plan your holiday between Sydney and Brisbane. Then I moved on to integrating CiviCRM with Drupal, Alfresco, a bit of document management, records management, all tied together with this custom Zen framework. And that was really the first time where I'd seen open source productized in an actual product. Then I got shoulder tapped and said, look, you're doing this stuff, why don't you come over to New Zealand and do this for the public sector? And I thought, oh, okay, why would I go to Wellington? Then they sent me to Wellington, just, just try it out, have a look. And so far I haven't looked back, it's been absolutely brilliant living in Wellington. So what I do is I work exclusively with the public sector and some very large enterprises that work with the public sector. So uh, the perspective I'll give you today is essentially how would you target uh, large enterprises that have very stringent requirements and the same carried over to a government organisation. So to cover off, today we'll have a look at, to get everyone on the same page, we'll have a look at exactly what a public sector organisation looks like, what they do, what they get up to, and we'll then go and say, where can we fit your solution in there, how can you sell it, and how to follow this slippery process that we call due process, and uh, we'll have a look at that. So, a typical cross-section is a minister, then a secretary, executives, public servants, and then a supply chain underneath. So just to make sure we're all on the same page, typically the department of a government is a secretary, an executive, and public servants, and the other two uh, fit in alongside that. So the minister is the only person that is elected by the public. This is the people you ballot for and put the uh, paper in the ballot box. Now, they administer what's called a portfolio, and a portfolio is a group of departments. For example, you might administer the, you might be the Minister for Agriculture, and you'll administer agriculture, fisheries, waterways, and a few other things that are related. Now, they promote what's called outcomes, and as you can see, outcomes is in italics on the screen there, and that's because outcomes is a key word. If you go to a departmental website, you will find their outcome statement, or you will find their statement of intent, the mission statement, and it will be, our outcomes are to deliver X, Y, and Z. Now, outcomes are 
they're a two-edged sword, really. They're varied, they're ethereal, there could be something like we're going to increase the efficiency of the public transport network. They could be something that is very, very specific, such as we're going to commit 200 million to rural education. So outcomes really are the trend setting or the direction setting of a government department. Now then comes the secretary. The secretary is the CEO, essentially, of an organisation. They're appointed by a minister for a fixed term usually a contract of about three to five years, and they report to the minister, and they have to deliver that outcome. So what that means is the minister goes to the media, puts their hand on heart and says, we're going to deliver this. Then they go back to the secretary and says, um, I just told everyone out there you have to deliver it. And that is why secretaries get grey hair very quickly. So they have to deliver it. Now, executives. The executives manage the day-to-day -day operation. So what they do is they create budgets, they allocate resources, and they produce what's called outputs. So that's a very key term there as well. Outputs are what the organisation produces as a result of day-to-day -day work. Now, sometimes they're called different things. Assistant secretaries, deputy assistant secretaries. Usually they have a chief officer in their title, so CIO, CFO, CTO, that kind of stuff. Uh, in the police and military, there might be deputy commissioner, major general, lieutenant general, that kind of thing. So the outputs they deliver are actually legislated. So if they say we're going to deliver some kind of output which is public transport, they have to deliver that transport in order to get funding. So what they do is actually very, very important. Then we have the public servants. So these are the middle managers and the staff making the world go round. So HR, finance, IT, frontline staff. So they do the day-to-day -day work. And they consume the resources that have been allocated by the executives. And so part of their work contributes towards this output, which is the direction the organisation is going. So then at the end of it, you've got the supply chain. So private supplies of goods and services, other public organisations, so for instance, you might have a land information department. They do geospatial surveying, mapping, and they might provide the result of their work to a local council who deals in streets, roads, property, so that kind of thing. And then we've got vendors. Now, vendors deliver and support a good or service. Now, it could be that vendors do something cheaper, faster, and quicker than having to train the internal staff. So. By having to train internal staff, you're taking them off the role that they're good at and making them train in something that they're going to be good at at a later time. So it may be cheaper just to get a vendor to come in and do that bit for you. The corollary to that is that you can free up staff to do a better job by coming in and taking over some kind of function. So being a vendor is a really good place to be if you can say, hey, we can make you put more staff into the front line serving the citizens by clearing up the back office. So rather than having 10 people scanning your emails, let's send your, e your letters, let's send them to a mail processing center where it's automatically scanned and automatically put into your system. And those 10 people can then go and start serving more customers who come into your front door. So that's what vendors can do. Now, let's think about levels. You've got minister, secretary, executives, public servant, supply chain. And sometimes it can get a bit complicated as to who does what, because a minister can look at one or two departments or two or three portfolios. Or more than one minister can look after one, so it's a bit of a many-to-many -many relationship. Then, Mad Hatter style, everyone changed seats, machinery of government change, that's a technical term. Everyone shuffles around, departments are moved here and put there and all of a sudden the contacts you've been developing are gone. So rather than thinking about who's the one particular person, in a generic sense, let's think about the different levels. We've got the political level, the executive level, and the operational level. So what that means is if you're a director of a company, you really want to be engaging at the political and executive level because that's what the government expects you to do. If you are a, for example, a solutions architect, you would want to do you would want to connect to people at the operational level and perhaps the executive level to get them to understand what you're proposing. So the levels essentially allow us to abstract away the people that are shuffling and allow us to concentrate, okay, we're targeting these people this week 
and these people next week to give them the resources they need to work together. So let's work with these levels. The outcomes get promoted from the political level. The outputs come out of the operational level. So in a sense, what this means is that the outcomes is the direction the minister and the government is saying, this is where we need to go. The outputs is where the organisation is actually going. And sometimes, as Kate Lundy said this morning, it's a big ship and turning that ship around to start going in a different direction can be difficult. So, what does this mean for us as uh, people who supply goods and services? Well, when outcomes don't match the outputs, that is the best place for you to be because that is the place where you can say, hey, I realise you're going in this direction, but your minister says you have to go in this direction. We've got some low-cost stuff we can do to save the headache of having to switch everything at once. So it is the best place for you to be, to realise this value proposition. And that value proposition is become a trusted advisor. Become the person that the CIO goes, I've got this headache. Who do I talk to? I know, I'll talk to my mate, give him a call. He'll give me some good and bad ideas and I'll be able to get at least a picture of what's out there, what I can do. So the best position to be in is to be where the organisation knows that the outcomes and the outputs aren't matching. They know that you've got a plan to help it, but more importantly, they know that you're helping them get a plan to get funding, because in the government, nothing happens without funding. Now, how do you, how do you find out exactly where things are not working, and how do you find out where you can fit in? Well, it comes down to something called enterprise architecture. So enterprise architecture is the place where business meets IT. So every organisation has, uh, of a certain size, every organisation has what's called an enterprise architect. And you they have different titles. You can find them by the couple of key things. What they do, they create the three to five year roadmaps of the whole ecosystem. So you might have an infrastructure architect, an information architect, a network architect, so they all put together their roadmaps to create the plan of what is it that we're going to do. So they report to the CIO, or sometimes for smaller organisations, they are the CIO. So what you straight away know is, okay, we know the CIO, let's have a look down the corporate, uh, uh, the corporate um, chain and see who reports to them. Maybe they are the enterprise architect. So. Why is enterprise architecture really, really, really important? The reason why is because enterprise architecture is the recipe for the organisation. So, for example, if the enterprise architects are going, you know what, we haven't invested in our phone system for the last 10 years. Let's, for the next 12 months, really focus on getting a state-of-the-art VoIP-based system that people can just take their phone, sit at another desk in our other regional office, plug in, they know where they are, their phone number automatically routes to them, they get uh, WAV files sent to them as uh, voicemails via email, let's do that. Now, 12 months, they have agreed they're going to focus on this. If you come in trying to sell them a website, they're focused on something completely different and you may be facing some disappointment when you get the pushback and the resistance. So again, it's the... It's the 80-20 rule. Uh, if you have a new CIO or a new enterprise architect, they're going to want to make some quick wins. And quick wins means they get their stripes, they get the reputation in the organisation to make the stuff they want happen. So what can you do to bring together the business and the IT side to get some quick wins on the board? So there's usually a personality issue. The business has some requirements, IT has some requirements. Usually business is, at the end of the day, headed by the CFO, the person who signs the check, the accountant. IT is headed by the CIO, the person who brings together. So what happens is the CFO stands over here and the CIO comes to him and the CFO thinks, this guy coming to me again wanting to spend money on gadgets and this, that and the other. All I want to do is manage the risk of my investments. Why is it such a difficult thing to be happy with what it, you've already got? The CIO, on the other hand, is coming in and saying, 
we've got to do this particular outcome because your guys told my guys that they need to start using Dropbox in-house. Well, you can't do that. Well, exactly, that's why we need another solution. So the conversation happens and usually there's a bit of a clash between the two. So, can you be a friend to the CFO and the CIO? If you can bring them together, then you're in that trusted advisor role that says, hey, look, I can help you get on the good side with the CFO. This solution that I'm proposing you will manage the risk of whatever the CFO is afraid of, and vice versa. So there's a word on there called innovative, and innovative is overused, but let's say in government, innovative is used to describe an outcome that links to an output of a public organisation. So the principle is called do more with less. So organisation or a department that's called innovative is a department that can go in and say, hey, you've cut our budget, but that's okay. We've rearranged our internal processes, we've done a few different things, and now we're delivering a better service than before. Thanks for cutting our budget. It's not a worry to us. <laughs> that is an innovative government organisation. And the best thing is, you can help them become that. So, as part of enterprise architecture, there is something called the roadmap. And the roadmap is a three to five year plan of what application systems, what infrastructure systems are going to be put into the whole enterprise. So there's a couple of names there, TOGAF, Mikey 2.0, Dragon 1 EA. They are essentially different methodologies. Now TOGAF is by far the most popular one. If you're talking to CIOs and enterprise architects, really, really helpful if you know the TOGAF uh, uh, naming the domain specific terms. Because what it does, it allows you to create a plan that the CIO, everyone, we're human, we don't want to do more work than we have to. The CIO can take your plan and just say, hey, this is already using the right terminology, it's already using the right concepts, I can just integrate this into my roadmap. And that puts you in a fantastic position as that trusted advisor of goods and services. So, so what that means really is, if you're coming in and saying, hey, we've got this awesome website we can do for you, but the business doesn't want a website, then really it's like having a waiting room where you're sitting there and you've got a toothache. And a doctor comes in to you and says, hey, you know what, I'm a splint doctor, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna get your leg measurements, we're going to create this awesome cast for you. We're going to iteratively put the cast on and we're going to let it set for a bit and then we'll go live by taking the cast off and voila, you'll have a perfect non-broken leg. You're sitting there with a tooth, not a leg. Same thing with a roadmap. If the roadmap is saying we've already just invested a number of dollars in our online presence, we're going to focus on something internal, keep Hounding the people is just going to make them your enemy. They're not going to be friends with you because you keep annoying them because they've got a different headache to fix than the one you're suggesting. But what you can do is you can say, hey, I realise I'm selling you web, but I know a guy who does some kind of VoIP infrastructure. Maybe I can put the two of you together. You might be able to have a chat and come up with something. So what that means is you become the connector, and the connector is a very important thing because... If you have this network of people who rely, who you rely on and they rely on you, you're at the centre of knowing, oh, yeah, so this person I've just spoken to, I've got this mate, he's um, looking to upgrade his infrastructure, but you know what, I've, uh, do you want to meet with him, have a chat? Yeah, sure. In the course of discussion, you might find out that one of his clients is looking to upgrade their website. And all of a sudden, tit for tat, you've both got a bit of business together. In the future, you'll be more willing to share, and that is a really powerful networking opportunity for you. So assist the CIOs. Whether or not you get, have a good or service right now doesn't mean you can't provide someone to them to help them with that. So know the terms, know TOGAF, know the language that is used, because that's really important. It, it's straight away, you're part of their group, of their world, and they see that you understand what they're talking about, what their pain points are. So this is the TOGAF Enterprise Architecture. This is their statement. You don't have to read all of it, but essentially, Enterprise Architecture, according to TOGAF, is a way 
to optimize existing and legacy business processes to make them more responsive to change. Because the issue is not that an organization is profitable or unprofitable. The issue is that we're with the web, with the internet moving so quickly, our technology changes so often, if an organization can't change and keep up with the times, very quickly it becomes a case study or a post-mortem of an organization. So this is why so many people it use TOGAF to essentially manage their infrastructure. It's like using Six Sigma for production. So there are four big innovative outcomes in government. They're talked about non-stop. And if you want to, you need to know them off the top of your head. Social, big data, mobile, cloud. Now, the CIOs are talking about them not because the term is overused, but because what each term represents to them. Now, in terms of social, for an, for an enterprise and a government organization, being social means that you get feedback as soon as you go to market. So your citizens can talk to you, your constituents can talk to you. Big data means that what you can do is you can analyze all the information that you can collect and then start creating metrics and say, well, we've spent $20 million on this feature, but 50% of our users are using a different feature, so let's invest some money on that. So what that means is that government organizations particularly can effectively manage public funds, and that's a really important thing which we'll cover in a bit. Mobile, we're all doing mobile. Now, cloud and what's called access, so that's software as a service, infrastructure as a service, platform as a service, application as a service, you name it as a service. Uh, really important for government today because what they want to do is they want to move away from a capital expenditure model where you buy an asset through to an operational expenditure model where you buy a good or service for a limited time. So those are the big four. And if you can drop those in conversation, say, hey, look, we realize that different people mean different things. For us, this is what we mean by this term. So let's have a chat about open source. And uh, in open source, there is a certain meaning that you get out of it. For a government official, the government domain language for open source means something slightly different. So let's have a look at what that means. So, so if you're sitting at a table and somebody who doesn't know open source has come in and said, okay, I'm the guy signing the check, and you mention open source, this is what usually comes to mind. So source is corporate information. It's the data system where everything is stored. It forms part of the single source of truth, which governments hammer down so much. Avoid duplication, deduplicate, get your data in order, make one single source of truth, that kind of stuff. And it also represents their own intellectual property, and we'll cover off why that's really important. Now, what does open mean? Open means accessible in government, such as open government. Proactive disclosure, where governments say, hey, if there was an FOI request, we'd probably give it the information to them. So let's just give the information to the public now. So that's what open source means. Now, for us, open source is a technical term. It's technical language, along with lambda functions and uh, anonymous functions. And what it does, it denotes philosophy. Philosophy around creation and collaboration of content, such as source code, hardware, graphic art techniques, really anything can be done in an open source way. So there sometimes gets a bit of a conflict of interest where people who don't understand open source have preconceived ideas about it, especially people who sign the checks. So when you say, oh, it's open source, what is it? Well, it's usually for a website, a Drupal base, configured modules, custom modules, theme, maybe some DNS settings to make it look like it's under their domain. So what they see is something slightly different. What they see is this application has got everything that I own. Everything that my organi organization does is in this application and it's open. So what they see is that the operational level, as we mentioned before, is putting so much effort into making intellectual property and all of a sudden that intellectual property gets given out for nothing. That is a certain element of concern. Now, the reason why it's an element of concern is not necessarily really, really obviously logical. So in two things, if you have an information leak, now an information leak is not something that is 
an accident, it's something that the media calls an information leak, which is where it's really important. If you have an information leak, whether it's because of un or improperly described proactive disclosure, what happens is that as an executive, your career is now tarnished with the brush of, you bought this system, it was open, and now look, your information is out. Now, people in the public sector tend to be career people. So that means they go from one department to a ministry, to a department, to a council, back to a department. So if in one of the particular departments they have a security issue, essentially that career is over. So that's why organisations that purchase goods and services really in the government, security is number one. It is the number one thing for government purchasing. So the other thing is it's part of something called achievement. And this term we'll look into in a bit later. But if you have information that you've created and you don't give that information out or you give it out improperly, that affects this term called achievement. We'll have a look at that in a second. So if you are really, really passionate about open source, and that's fantastic, what you need to do is you need to educate them about the merit of open source. Educate them in language that they understand of what is open source. Now, you do that by creating mind share. And mind share is a term used to describe how much something or someone thinks about you. If you're always in front of mind because you're the person, you're the first person they go to call when there's an issue, you've got mind share. So what does that mean? If you give them the tools, because at the end of the day, if they're signing as a CFO, they're signing the check, the secretary is going to say, why are we buying this solution? Now, if the CFO does not understand what open source is, they're going to go, oh, I don't know, and they can't do that. So what we need to do is we need to give them all the tools and materials they need to properly understand what open source is. Now, we'll have a quick look about how we can describe what open source is. When you purchase goods and services in government, you have a line item that goes into a particular budget. So the open source line item needs to be not we're buying some good and service that we don't really understand. It needs to be we're buying risk mitigation. What we're buying is the ability for any developer or any support organisation to look at the core of our system and provide support that we may not otherwise get. So if you position your solution and give it to them in these kind of terms, say, hey, look, if you've got this open source product, what that means is if we can't support it as an organisation, you can hire anyone, really, who knows how to support this, and you can go ahead and keep supporting it. So what that means is for you, it's risk mitigation. And they love that. And if you keep going along those terms, then what happens is it's not your solution, it's their solution, because they understand exactly what they're getting and that is the really valuable thing. So it's about open source when the optimum result is a solution to a business problem. So what that means is a lot of the time I'm in, a, in say, a bidding process where we're negotiating stuff and we've got a partner who's uh, perhaps uh, particularly passionate about something and they say, great, we're going to give you this open source solution and it's going to be fantastic. And the buyer doesn't really understand that because they're talking technical to a person who doesn't talk technical. So what that means is that you need to give people who sign checks the solution to the problem, not the technology. Because if you give them a solution that takes away their headache, underpinned by really good risk management, then it doesn't matter what the technology is. Because for them, they need to deliver an output for the organisation. The output they need to deliver has to be something that they can go into the public and say, yes, we did this. The actual technology behind it is coming second place. So that's really a really important point. So technology is an enabler, and open source is a really efficient enabler, but it's not the key point. So sell the solution, sell the entire solution as something that'll solve a business problem. The technology will just fall in line as part of the process. So since we're talking about selling, let's have a look at a sales team. Unfortunately, sales seems to be a dirty word. And it's true. Some people ruin the reputation for others. But what a sales team in the healthy sense of the word is, it's a team that converts coffee and phone calls 
into signed deals. You can relate to that, yeah? Absolutely. So what we need is the three Ds, discipline, direction, and drive. So a sales team needs discipline because if you're going, hey, as a salesperson, go sell something. Where do I start? So discipline needs to be there to go, hey, you're going to be selling stuff. So the process of making a sale is very, very important. Now, in government, the process of making a sale is very long. So you need to break down barriers with people as a salesperson, but not barriers of any kind of like, can I call you? It's barriers of understanding. Because if you make mind share in the mind of a person with whom you're dealing to say, hey, you know, this isn't a salesperson who's going to sell me something. This is a person who's going to fix my problem. That is the barrier of understanding. And unfortunately, a lot of salespeople are very gung-ho. Yes, go and sign on the dotted line. We'll have a coffee. We'll do this. We'll do that. And it'll be awesome. And, th and that's the wrong approach. The right approach is to say, hey, look, I realize that there's a problem. And this is the solution I can see for your problem. And what happens is you don't sell them on the idea. They sell themselves on your idea and create their own solution. So when it comes to direction, as a business owner now, make sure that your sales team has a clear direction of where they need to go. Whether it's one specific vertical, whether it's a market niche, make sure that they're not chasing every low-hanging fruit because it reminds me of an organization really in Wellington that essentially chases any deal they can get. And sure, it's, they're successful. But the problem is their sales team is worn out. They're fatigued because as soon as they come back into the office, oh look, you've got this really awesome opportunity, go get it. They don't know anything about how to install coffee pots into fridges. They're an IT salesperson, but no, this is an opportunity for Java because it runs on any device. So again, this is keep your sales team in a clear direction. If you need to go in a different direction, create a different sales team. And then there's drive. A sales team needs to be passionate. And they need to be passionate not about getting more money, but about achieving the best result for their customer. And that's really, really important. Get your sales team so passionate about delivering the best solution with the technology offering that you have. And the question is, how do you make a good salesperson into a great salesperson? Rule number one, always be closing, ABC. Always be closing. Who's seen uh, Glenn Gary Glenn Ross, the movie? Yes? That speech, that 10 minute speech. Now, a little bit of trivia, uh, the, uh, the actor performing the 10 minute speech, that was his only 10 minutes on screen and he won a very, very esteemed award for that. So in a sales team, it's always important to be closing, not to keep dragging the process. Because in government, the process already drags on. Don't help it. Get the process done quickly. So typically, the government expects you to have this particular type of sales team. So you have a sales director, you have an account manager, a business developer, and then technical sales. So an account manager, they're essentially, they look after the existing clients. They educate existing clients with the new products and services that your organization is doing. They also look after support for existing clients. Now, the most important thing they do is they give the people in your client organization the ability to be first to know of what the market is doing, which means those people can go to the boss and say, hey, there's this new thing called e-discovery. Have you heard about it? No? Well, I've heard about it. Let me tell you. And they look better in front of their boss. Business development, that's hunting. New business, acquire new clients, manage contracts, go through that whole process. So once the sales process is done, the deal is signed, the client is handed over to the account manager. Then in the middle, you've got the technical sales. Technical sales essentially is like the, the person who says, no, we can't put a coffee pot in the, tea, in the refrigerator because we don't sell refrigerators. So they create the solution set and they assist the business developer and the account manager and they provide essentially pre-sales support to get the whole process across the line. The sales director is a very important role because that role essentially mediates between the sales, the CEO, and the customer. They mediate the whole process to provide deals to say, hey, look, 
let's just give you a bit of a discount to make this deal go ahead because sometimes it may be important. So they set the price, they get the contracts done. They're essentially the key enabler of smooth functioning. So this sales team is going to go out. They're going to go and make some stuff, make some deals. So it'll be awesome. So let's talk about how to get funding from your clients. Bad news. Funding is allocated 12 to 18 months in advance, meaning if you're coming in and trying to have a quick sale, there is highly likely that that budget, unless it's been previously allocated, just isn't there. Now your project is going to be competing with a few other projects, which means that only some projects can go ahead and be implemented. And what that means is that the safe projects are going to go ahead of the risky ones. So what does it mean? Well. Unlike traditional business, you don't really have uh, a sense of, well, if we get to the top, the CIO, the CFO, the CEO will go and say, yes, make it happen. It's a solution I need. What happens is you've got twofold competition. And the competition has got nothing to do with your competitors. It's got to do with the media and the public's perception of your department. So the secretary has two aims, and their two aims is this. How can they make the minister achieve the outcome that the minister has said? Which means changing the direction of the organization output to match that outcome. The second one is, how can you make the public appreciate the organization? And uh, I think Kate touched on that this morning about having, being in a position where the public really understands that a policy is successful and it's not a PR disaster, even though the policy has done a good job. So. What does SAFE mean? And we'll cover this off in a, in a second. SAFE means following due process. It means respecting documentation, privacy, and security that the department needs. Now, departments need differing levels of both. So for example, if you're looking to make a website for Department of Defense, that's a slightly different security requirement to making a website for the Department of Fish. So make sure you respect the documentation and the security and the privacy that you need. You need credibility. Credibility is paramount in government. There is nothing more than losing a deal because you weren't credible. And credible means you have established implementation in the marketplace. You can point to say, hey, your colleagues have already done this. You don't want to be behind the ball of your colleagues. They're, they're ahead of you. Look, they're already using our software. You wouldn't say it in those terms, but it's very competitive in government. You don't want one council to outdo another. Give them both the way to uh, get, get ahead. So you need to somehow get funding. So you know that if you've got a solution that's safe, you respect it all, how do you get funding? Well, there's what's called the funding threshold. And that's this big scary thing. So you've got Commonwealth procurement rules. It's a document, you can go look it up on the net. And that tells you in Australia the rules you need to follow. And the limit for Australia is $80,000 in New Zealand same document, slightly different name, and $100,000 in New Zealand. So at the threshold, and this represents total contract value, at this threshold, the organization, if they want to buy off you, has to go to tender to public process. Below the threshold, they may still choose to go to tender, but they don't have to, which means if you give them a really good idea or a really good reason why they should waive the tender process, you won't have to go through the whole lengthy documentation phase because it's a low risk solution. So above the threshold, you might have, you run into other thresholds that aren't publicly documented. So for example, a CFO might only be able to sign $200,000. If your deal is above that, it might have to be signed by the secretary who can only sign $400,000. And that's called delegated authority. And that exists in enterprise as well. Now, anything more goes to the cabinet. And the cabinet sits down once a year in something called the Financial and Expenditure Committee. It's a very, very, very scary term, isn't it? And what it is, it's the cabinet sits down and all the departments, all the ministries basically say, this is what we want to do. Have our bucket of project ideas. So the cabinet sits down for two weeks and they go through all the ideas and they allocate funding. Now the, cons the consequence of that particular process is that one project 
has 40 seconds to one minute of airtime. They look at it, is this aligned to our strategic direction? Is this aligned to our ICT strategy that we've published last year? No, nope. in the bin. Next. Nope, in the bin. Next. So that's how it happens because there is just so much competition. So what that means is you need a really, really, really punchy story. So who was here at Kate Lundy's presentation this morning? Oh, wow, everyone. Fantastic. Almost everyone. Cool. So did you notice how she was talking about the statistics that she represented? She said, we had a 48% increase in uptake of this policy. We had a 30%. That is how ministers talk. And the reason why they talk like that is because they have to substantiate the outcome they said with what actually happened two years later. So this is the world they live in right now. may not be the optimum world, but that's what they have to live right now. So it reminds me of a particular story where this brief, this abstract that went to the Financial Expenditure Committee went along the lines of, hey, we want to increase public transport efficiency by 30% and increase the travel satisfaction of citizens in southern Queensland by 45%. And to do that, we just need two and a half million dollars. That's, yeah, that's by the by. Can anyone guess what the actual project they were suggesting was? Close. They were wanting to buy a bunch of UV, of uh, V, what are they called? radios on trains and buses so that the train could radio the bus and say, hey, we're five minutes from station, don't leave yet. Now, if they would have said, hey, can we have two and a half million for radios? What would the uh, committee say? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, next. So the abstract gets created by the CFO and the CIO and the secretary and that goes to cabinet. What that means is a lot of people don't know, and this is in the public sector, a lot of them don't know they have to create this and that it has to be short, punchy, and in the language of the ministers. What that means for you is that you can go through and say, hey, do you guys know that your project is going to be up for review? If it is, is there anything we can help to help you write that brief? Because ultimately you'll be in control of what goes to the minister because there is so many briefs to write, they'll be more than happy to get you to help them to write this particular one. So that's just something that, uh, that happens in the... Uh, in the uh, funding. So we've got due process. Now bureaucracy or red tape unfortunately is the government's way of accountability. So if you're sitting on the decision making hot seat and you have to sign a check or sign something then if you follow due process what that means is you're following something that has been defined as being the most fair way to buy something. Now, it may not be the best way, but in terms of how public servants are career people, if the department has said, follow this process because this is the best way for us to work, and you don't follow it, the news will spread that you're not quite following the policies of your government. Again, being a career person, you don't want to lose your career over something that simple. So, if you prove that you followed the meetings, the process, the forms, the emails, then you're protected because you did the best thing you could under the situation. If you did your due diligence, if you did all the research you could, you went to market, the market responded, you did the best thing you could. The process is supreme. What that means is that if you know the process, government organisations will be happy to work with you because you respect how they work. And it's just a people thing. If you respect a person, they'll respect you back. And that's the same on an organisational scale as well. So what's this thing about probity? The term probity means being decent and fair. So probity means that, for example, if you're a government organisation, you're going to market and you're going to spend 500000 on goods and services around the web. Probity means that each organisation is going to put in their best bid. They're not going to collude to give you an inflated price. Probity means that the organisations you deal with, you don't then say to another organisation, oh, this was their bid, can you do better? It's a two-way relationship and probity ensures the integrity of the government purchasing process. 
And again, this Latin phrase, I can't pronounce it unfortunately, but what it means is who will guard the guardians? And the probity process ensures that the government and the vendors are both being fair to each other. So let's have a look at some stages. You might see these in the market. Essentially, these are definitions of stages. So at the very start, a government organization has a bright idea. The light bulb goes ding, it's on. And they go, right, I want to buy widgets. What kind of widgets? I don't know, some of them. So they create what's called an expression of interest. An expression of interest is a document that goes into the marketplace and the marketplace responds. And EOI gauges the market for their interest in doing what you've asked them to do. Because there's no point saying, I want to buy a widget, and the market says, but we don't do widgets. We just, yeah, that's a silly idea. So once you've done an EOI as a government organization, and you've got your results back, you've got your vendors who are interested in responding, you then go and do an RFI, which is a request for information. An RFI, again, goes to the market, and it gauges the market solution maturity. So what it does is everyone responds, oh, yeah, we can make widgets out of duct tape and glue. Yeah. The RFI uncovers how mature a solution to your particular business need is. So then you've got the request for proposal or tender, usually RFP, RFT, same name. And that determines the best solution for your organization out of the available market. So the market is interested. The solutions the market suggests are mature. And RFP now picks the best one of them. So then you go what's to what's called a preferred supplier. And who's received a letter saying, you're the preferred supplier for our organization? You guys have got that? Yep. What that means is, OK, you're the one. We're going to try and uh, negotiate with you. Give us your best price. Give us your contracts. Let's try and make this work because we really like how we can work together. And then there's the signing of the contract. The sales team rings the bell, and it's all rainbows and unicorns and happiness and sunshine from there on. So this process is the full process. For example, if an organization is going to market for a web content management system, it's probably not going to do an EOI or an RFI. It knows the marketplace has web content management systems. The solutions are very mature. We know the marketplace is interested in responding. Let's just save everyone's time, go straight to RFP, buy off it, and sign the deal, get on with our jobs. So that process is linear. So you go EOI through. So you'd never go to an RFP and then back to an EOI. That just doesn't happen. But you go forward. So that's essentially the due process. And at the end of the day, it's not that scary, is it? Awesome. So that's more or less everything I wanted to cover. Are there any questions? There is, straight up. <laughs> Very good question. How do I know all this? Well, the two documents that I listed before, the mandatory rules for procurement and the Commonwealth buying rules, outline all of this in 120 pages. And let's just say I had a spare weekend one night. <laughs> Okay, so the question is, what's the is it is it worth doing all this effort for what you get back out of it? That, that's a really it's a tough question to to answer, yes or no. So, one thing where you can see is when the contract is signed, then that contract represents essentially accepted cash flow. So, halfway through the contract, unless you're really screwing things up, halfway through the contract, they're not going to back out and say, hey, yeah, we're not going to pay you anymore. So it, because it's a government purchasing program, it represents a certain surety of future cash flows. And for a person planning their, their business pipeline, that can be a very safe uh, kind of, sort of the minimum safe kind of thing that you do. Now, the other thing with, with government is that you get money from government that essentially you've put in. So 
if you're not happy as an individual with how the government is managing your funds, then being part of the process that helps the government in being more efficient really helps you in return. So there could be a bit of a, a self-interest uh, goal there where you say, hey, look, I think that the government can do a much better job using this solution. Now, to really sort of get to the point of is it worth it, well, if you have a dedicated sales team focusing on government, because it's such a slow process, what that means is you can have so many different opportunities on the go at once. And after the first 24 months, you'll essentially have all your ducks in a row going forward, which means that potentially it is worth it. But it's not worth it straight away. So it'd be more of a strategic investment from that perspective. Another question? So the question is, how do you find the RFPs? And the answer is yes. So how you find them is, in Australia, it's called Ostender. It's a website. And you subscribe to various categories of RFP. In New Zealand, it's called GETS. And government organisations are legislated to put everything on Ostend or GETS. So you can... There's TenderLink, which is paid. Yeah, there's TenderLink, which is paid. But Ostender should be free. But you have to go through a qualification process to say, yes, I'm this organisation, yes, this is my address, and that kind of stuff. But yeah, definitely. So the, the, tender, the tender list is one of those things that should be available to the public for no charge, that kind of thing. It's that kind of list. Yes. So the question is about panels. How do we work with panels? So, yep. So there's two types of, of group buying that government has. It's called syndicated procurement or panels. Syndicated procurement is when two or three ministries or departments come together and they do one RFP and they all can buy off that one process. A panel is where that process happens but not necessarily anyone buys off at the end. So you go through the RFP process and the end result is, great, you're allowed on a panel. And so from that, what, what it means is that you're first and foremost, as you mentioned, so the government goes, okay, we need a web content management system. Let's look at our panel. And in Australia, the, the organisation is AGIMO, Australian Government Information Management Office. And that organisation basically says, these are the panels that we've got. And you go to the panel and you say, hey, um, we're going to contact these four organisations and get them to do a closed tender, potentially, or get them to answer first. So in terms of answering the question, I would say that if you can get the hang of basic RFPs first, getting on a panel would be fantastic. Um, but it's a much longer process still. That's right. So the question is, how similar is the state process for the f to the federal process? So in terms of state, um, so you have buying groups in state government. So for example, in New South Wales, there's the New South Wales procurement arm. And they publish documents that essentially say, this is what we can do as a state department. So in every state would have a similar type of procurement department, which will then give you guidance as to which panels um, which syndicated procurements are currently in place. But I would say overall, the best place to be is at on AGIMO for federal because you, you can just carry over essentially. Another question, yes.
Yeah, that's a really good point. So just to repeat that, that a lot of time the people on the other side who've got this big, big pile of RFP responses on their desk, they're going through and the answers aren't what was asked. And so that can harm how well you're perceived because you didn't really answer the point of what was asked. So uh, make life easier for yourself and the people who have to review your work. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely, yeah. Cool, are there any other questions? Yes. So the question is, how would you avoid being sort of labelled as politically aligned when there's uh, certain things going through in machinery of government change? Cool. Okay, so in that, the, the top level of apolitical uh, government structure would be the secretary. So if you are really careful about your work and you stop contacting above the secretary, then essentially you're working with the Department of Government as opposed to with a particular government in situ or a political party. So I would say if, if, you really, if that's really a concern and it is a very valid concern when government changes because all of a sudden you're now talking to the shadow government, um, that's a very important point, yeah. So keep talking at the secretary or CEO level um, to avoid getting labelled as friends of a specific party. We, we are out of time, um, but um, look, that was a, fa a fantastic uh, session, David. Um, I thought that that was very well measured, very well informed, uh, and very uh, skillful and carefully staged. So could you please join me in thanking David Kalkali? <laughs> Excellent. Now, as always, your feedback uh, would be much appreciated. You, um, you can find the feedback uh, form on the um, session page uh, for, this, uh, for this session. Uh, next, we have coffee for half an hour and lucky last session at a quarter to four. Thank you very much. <laughs>